we are looking through the minor prophets and we've come to the book of Nahum. Some people call uh, Nahum Jonah's dream <laughs> because Nahum's all about God's judgment on Assyria and specifically Nineveh. It's what Jonah wished God had sent him to preach actually. And yet Nahum's about something bigger than that. It's about God as a warrior, God as divine judge. And really the whole Old Testament makes it clear that God is going to defeat his enemies. God has lots of enemies and he's going to win. And yet, as we uh, see this theme throughout Scripture, God is going to defeat his enemies, God as warrior, overcoming and winning this great battle, we might wonder, can God really do it? I mean, there are so many people who hate God. And so Nahum is an Old Testament illustration that God can do it. It is not hard for him. He can win this war. This is a illustration of how God can defeat even the most fearsome of enemies, which makes it kind of exciting, actually. And Nahum begins by declaring God's judgment on Nineveh in chapter 1. And he opens up verses 1 through 8 with this picture of God as the powerful judge. If you look at verses 2 and 3, what stands out to you? As you listen to these verses, the Lord is a jealous and avenging God. The Lord is avenging and wrathful. The Lord takes vengeance on his adversaries and keeps wrath for his enemies. The Lord is slow to anger and great in power. And the Lord will by no means clear the guilty. Those are very God-centered verses, first of all. The Lord, God, the Lord, the Lord, the Lord, the Lord. And of course, that's where we need to start when we begin to become overwhelmed by the chaos we see in this world. With God. We need a God-centered perspective. And what does Nahum tell us about God? He tells us that God is jealous and avenging. And he tells us that over and over. And that may bother some people. God's jealousy does bother people. But there are times where it is right to be jealous, of course. I think of the husband-wife relationship. This is a special relationship. And the husband demonstrates that this relation is special by being jealous for it. If he's not jealous, it's not very special. One way God demonstrates his love for his people and for his glory is through his jealousy over them, over his people and his absolute zeal to keep the commitments that he made to them. Avenging means to pay back. And the idea comes from Exodus 20, verses 5 and 6, and Exodus 34, 6 and 7, which is the same verse Jonah quoted, actually, in Jonah 4, 2. So much of the Old Testament is quotes of the Old Testament. What did Jonah say to Yahweh when Nineveh wasn't destroyed? He said, I know you're slow to anger. I know you're Exodus 34. This is why I didn't want to go, because this is who you are. You're so patient. And now God says, I am patient, but I'm also jealous and avenging. He moves on to give us some more pictures of God. He says his way is in the whirlwind and storm. And again, you might think of the allusion to Nineveh or to Jonah. A storm saved Nineveh the first time by bringing Jonah to preach. But the storm isn't going to save Nineveh this time. And what do storms bring? They bring rain. And that's going to be a key to how Nineveh falls, actually. Assyrians often use pictures of storms to describe themselves. For example, one of their emperors said, I'm like a glowing flame, which like the rush of a storm overthrows the enemy's land. And another said, I am like a hurricane. And still another, against all the host of wicked enemies, I rumbled like a storm. And God's like, really? <laughs> you think you're, the, you're in charge of the storm? No. I'll show you the real storm master. What does God say he's able to do in verses 4 and 5? How does the earth respond to his greatness? He rebukes the sea and makes it dry. He dries up all the rivers. Bashan and Carmel wither. The bloom of Lebanon withers. The mountains quake before him. The hills melt. The earth heaves before him. The world and all who dwell in it. God is the sovereign ruler over all of creation. Creation is in a sense here, is in a sense here, even afraid of God. And that leads to a question in verse 6. What does, Noah, what does Nahum ask? 
He asks, who can stand before his indignation? Who can endure the heat of his anger? Everybody should think, if God can make the mountains quake and the hills dissolve, then who is going to be able to stand before him? That's a big question in the prophets. What do the sinners in Zion ask in Isaiah 33, verse 14? They say, who among us can dwell with the consuming fire? Who among us can dwell with the everlasting burnings? What does the prophet Joel ask in Joel 2.11? For the day of the Lord is great and very awesome. Who can endure it? What does Malachi ask in Malachi 3.2? But who can endure the day of his coming? Then who can stand when he appears? Have you ever asked yourself this question? Was there ever a time when you were overwhelmed with a sense of your inability to stand before a holy and awesome God? After warning about this judgment, Nahum describes what it's like in verse 6. He talks about heat, he talks about fire, he talks about rocks breaking. It's scary. And what's the only hope to survive God's wrath, according to verse 7? The Lord is good, a stronghold in the day of trouble. He knows those who take refuge in Him. But what happens to those who don't take refuge in Him, according to verse 8? But with an overflowing flood, He will make a complete end of His adversaries and will pursue His enemies into the darkness. Now, already, just in a few verses, Nahum's told us a lot of different things about God. What is God like, according to Nahum 1, verses 2 through 8? He is jealous, he is avenging, he is wrathful, he is slow to anger, he is just, he is sovereign, he is overwhelming, and he is good. You think the minor prophets aren't relevant? They show us so much about God, so much that we need to know about God. God is a great judge and he moves from looking at the judge the character of the judge to more specifically looking at the judgment in verses 9 through 14 what does he say Nineveh is doing in verse 9 he says what do you plot against the Lord now of course they don't necessarily know that they're doing that they're not thinking of it as plotting against Yahweh but in opposing God's people they're opposing God it's funny, but if you look at the kinds of things the Assyrians wrote, you'll see they were, all, they were always worried about other nations plotting against them. And this is basically a challenge to Nineveh. Whatever you devise against the Lord, He will make an end of it. God will make an end to your cities, and He will make a complete end. Trouble will not rise twice. Why? Because one time is enough for God to destroy them. What is Nineveh like according to verse 10? They are entangled thorns. They're painful to other people. They're like drunkards. They're insensitive to the seriousness of sin. And they're going to be like consumed stubble, fully dried. What does that say about them? They're going to be easily judged, like dry wood. It's easy to burn dry wood. And he tells us the reason in verse 11. They had a leader who made plans against God. And of course, the leader was making plans against God's people. But when you attack God's people, you attack God. And so God talks to Judah in verses 12 and 13, and he explains more thoroughly how he's going to judge Nineveh. He assures them while they are powerful, they will be cut down, and that though he's afflicted them for a period of time, he will set them free from Assyrian domination. No enemy, he says, can stand against God's people. Then he turns in verse 14 to talk to the ruler of Nineveh and tell him what's going to happen. He won't have any descendants to rule after him. His gods will be defeated, and God himself would dig his grave. And the fact is, when God digs a grave, he digs it well. God buried Nineveh, and the city wasn't discovered until the 1800s. People thought the Bible must not be true because we can't find a Nineveh, and then they found it in the 1800s, of course, because God had dug their grave. And so this is a message of good news for Judah. God's judgment on his enemies is good news for God's people. And so what does Nahum say in verse 15? What other passage of scripture does this sound like? He says, Behold upon the mountains the feet of him who brings good news, who publishes peace. That sounds like Isaiah 40. And when Isaiah says this, he's talking about the final days. But there's an echo here. How do I know there's going to be comfort like the Isaiah, like Isaiah says which about the latter days. How do I know God's going to be able to reverse the curse and establish his kingdom and all those things? In Nahum, we're getting a preview. God can defeat his enemies. After all, just look at what happened in Nineveh. Nobody thought Nineveh could be destroyed. And yet, where's Nineveh? Where's Nineveh? 
And this is important because you sometimes lose confidence in God. You worry whether God's going to be able to work all things out for good. At times like that, it's good to remember Nahum because Nahum is the anchor that God will provide comfort in the end. He's going to judge his enemies. He really is. After declaring judgment in chapter 1, he describes judgment in chapter 2. In verse 1, he tells Nineveh, get ready, it's coming. Man the ramparts, watch the road, dress for battle, collect all your strength, do everything you can do because you're about to be defeated. Why? We see God's great plan in verse 2. He's restoring the majesty of Jacob as the majesty of Israel. This is what God is seeking to do. But there are steps. And one small step in that direction guarantees the next move. Isaiah and the others have prophesied about the final days, and Nahum is describing one of the first steps towards those final days. But this first step is important because it leads to the next. Nineveh is going to be defeated, and that's going to prove that God can win this war. And then he gives a picture of the judgment of Nineveh in verses 3 through 13. And to understand this picture, you have to understand that Nineveh was surrounded by water. And in order to harness the water, one of the kings built an aqueduct and a dam going through the heart of the city. It wasn't like Venice, but it was a little like Venice, I guess. It wasn't Venice, Venice, but it was a little Venice. And he redirected the water through the city. So Nineveh is situated on huge rivers and they were using the water. Uh, um, they were uh, used to water is what I'm saying. Actually, they, were, they, they had these rivers. They had, be, they had been um, able to control the rivers and use them for their benefit. And now Nahum's saying those rivers are going to turn against them. It's going to become a flood, which sounded crazy to them. We, we, we're already on top of this. We, we've lived with this for a long time. We've developed systems which would keep floods from happening. And he tells them, no, actually, your walls are going to collapse from a flood. And they would have thought, no, that's, that's one thing that's impossible. That's one thing we're ready for. Nineveh had a, a crazy defense system. There was no way to take out Nineveh. For one thing, the wall around the city was like three miles long. And it was high like a mountain. Plus, there was water all around it. The only way to take out Nineveh was to use the water against them. But who could do that? No one could do that except God. It was impossible to take Nineveh out, but God did. Why? So that he could comfort Israel. You saw God do something against impossible odds. And he predicted this like 60 years before it happened. And the assurance is, if God could control something like this so precisely, this judgment on his enemies, then we know the end is sure. What color is the shield of the mighty men in verse 3? It says scarlet. And that was the color of Nineveh. And the soldiers here are ready for war. They have their chariots and their spears. But what happens in verse 4? They're racing here and there. And in verse 5, as the enemies are coming against Assyria, their leaders can't quite figure out what to do. They're going this way. They're stumbling over here. Finally, they figure out they have to get to the wall. But in verse 6, it's already too late. The river gates are open and there's a flood and the entire city is destroyed. In just a short time, Nineveh goes from this great city to a pool in verse 8. And Nahum begins mocking them. The soldiers are yelling out, halt, halt, but no one listens. Everything's going to be stolen. Every alliance is going to be taken away. It's complete desolation. They will go from great power to no power. And as a result, who's going to be afraid of them? You are afraid of Nineveh? Seriously? Nineveh is going to be the one who's afraid. All the nations are subjected to Assyria. All the nations that are subjected to Assyria are going to be freed, including Judah. And remember, none of this has happened yet. Nahum's predicting it. When Nineveh was a world power. And in verses 11 and 12, Nahum asks a very strange question. He says, where is the lion's den? The feeding place of the young lions. Where are the lion and lioness? Where are their cubs with none to disturb them? And that seems like a strange question to us, but it wouldn't have been a strange question to the Assyrians. For one thing, their kings commonly compared themselves to lions. Tilgath Pileser wrote, I left the chariots and took my place at the head of my warriors. I was as bold as a lion. Aded Nirari boasted, When at the command of the great gods, my kingship and lordship is manifesting itself, going forth to plunder the good of the lands. I am royal. I am lordly. I am mighty. I am honored. I am exalted. I am glorified. I am powerful. I am brilliant. I am lion brave. I am manly. I am supreme. I am violent. Sounds like some other world leaders we might know. But he was comparing himself to a lion. I'm like a lion. Sargon. 
In the anger of my heart, I mustered the masses of Assur's troops, and raging like a lion, I set my face to conquer those lands. Sennacherib, I raged like a lion and gave the command to march into Babylon. I raged like a lion, I stormed like a tempest. Likewise, Urshaddon boasted, I roared like a lion, my passion was around. Like a lion I raged, I put on a coat of mail, my helmet, emblem of victory. Their rulers often compared themselves to lion, and they were known for their great lion hunts. The last king at the time of Nahum was known for dealing with the lion problem in the surrounding area. They saw themselves as great lion hunters. But Nahum says the situation is going to be reversed. You think you're a lion? You're going to be hunted down like a lion. Like you're hunting down lions. Where, where's the lion? You might, have, you might have once been like a lion, but you've been hunted and, and killed. You're gone. Why? Because the Lord is against them. Verse 13. After announcing judgment and describing judgment, Nahum defends God's judgment in chapter 3. And he opens up verses 1 through 7 by declaring woe on Nineveh. How does he describe the city in verse 1? What do these words tell us about them? He says, Woe to the bloody city, all full of lies and plunder, no end to the prey. Nineveh was powerful. Nineveh was manipulative. They presented themselves as the hope for the world. Come to Nineveh. You'll be safe. But what do they do once you get to the city? They kill you. They take your stuff. It's a deceitful city. We actually get an illustration of how Nineveh did that in Ezekiel 23. And uh, Ezekiel describes Israel like a whore. And he said that it, Israel was whoring after Assyria. They wanted Assyria. They wanted what Assyria had. And uh, God says he delivered her into the hands of her lovers. You want Assyria? You can have Assyria. And listen to what Assyria did to Israel. They uncovered her nakedness. They seized her sons and daughters. And as for her, they killed her by the sword. And she became a byword among women when judgment had been executed on her. Ezekiel saying, this city, Jerusalem, was like a lover. Um, or actually, let's go back. Nineveh was like a, a lover who was lying to the woman, Jerusalem, Judah, who was chasing her. Uh, or who was chasing him. Uh, Nineveh lied to people and said they were going to be good friends, but then turned on them. And here's what's ironic, though. In verse 2, Nahum talks about the crack of the whip and the rumble of the wheel. That's how it sounded in Nineveh. You know, it was always busy, like New York City, and, 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 and yet busy in an abusive way, taking advantage of people, cracking the whip, rum, make forcing, uh, rumbling the wheel. But normally, obviously, when Nineveh heard those sounds, it was Nineveh doing it to others. This time, though, it's not Nineveh doing it. It's being done to Nineveh. The bloody city is going to become bloody. The lying city is going to be lied to. The city that took plunder from others is going to become plunder. The hunter is going to become the prey. It's this reversal. And why, according to verse 4? And for all the countless whorings of the prostitute, graceful and of deadly charms, who betrays nations with their whoring and people with their charms. This is God's judgment. God says in verses 5 and 6 that he's going to disgrace them. And what will those who see Nineveh in the future say about her, according to verse 7? And all who look at you will shrink from you and say, Wasted is Nineveh. Who will grieve for her? Where shall I seek comforters for you? When you look at the way Assyria treated God's people in Ezekiel, you might think, does God care? God cares. <laughs> and he proves that he cares in the way that he takes vengeance on Nineveh. Obviously, living all these years later, it's difficult for us to appreciate how impossible this must have seemed. But it did seem impossible, Nahum's prophecy. Nineveh was a great city. I mean, you can imagine someone saying, New York, Paris, and London are going to be completely gone in 60 years. You'd be like, no, there's no way London's going to be gone in 60 years. But verses 8 through 13 of chapter 3 tell us this is not going to be hard for God. He compares Nineveh to others. Thebes have water around it, but Assyria conquered it. Nahum says, there's no difference between you two. God will do to you what you did to her. Sure, Nineveh might try to defend herself. And in verses 14 and following, Nahum tells him, try, try your best. Draw water for the siege, he says. It's as if God's saying, plan something against me, but it will come to the same end. You, you can make plans, but those plans will all come to absolutely nothing. What's going to happen? You were a great city. You were rich. You had many powerful leaders, but suddenly nothing. You're gone and the whole world's going to be happy. Obviously, we don't always like the idea of vengeance. 
until you see real evil in real life and you realize real evil needs to be punished. But if anyone's going to punish evil, who do you want to do it? God. Why? God has the wisdom to do it. He knows men's sins. God knows how deep their sin goes, and he knows what degree of punishment they deserve for their sin. God has the justice to do it. He's not influenced by outside forces. He's not partial. He is unchanging. If anyone's going to judge evil, it needs to be God. He has the wisdom. He has the justice. But the question is, does he have the power? Read Nahum. (laughs) Here's a case study. Here's proof. The city of Nineveh. This was a city that could not be destroyed. But where is it? Where is it? God can judge sin. He has, and he will. He is a divine warrior. He will defeat his enemies. He never, never loses.